right, hello, and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine, and Pipeliner CRM joining you as usual from San Diego. And today, I am delighted to be joined by Greg Vogt, who is just up the road a little bit in Sacramento, California, the top of the state. How are you doing, Greg? I'm doing well, John. How are you? Yeah, good, good, good. And I uh, hope things are doing well, uh, going well up there. And Greg is a professional uh, mental health speaker with Active Minds, the nation's premier nonprofit mental health organization for young adults, director of clinical outreach for Charlie Health, overseeing Northern California, and author of The Battle Against Yourself. And you also serve on the board, mem- board member of D- the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance in California, and you're passionate about advocating for mental health and suicide prevention, um, and you have your own uh, experiences with with mental health and, and suicide and, and recovery and all of that. And now you go to schools, universities, and corporate workplaces to help normalize the conversation around mental health. And I think, Greg, that's that's the place to start. Why... Why is it kind of in 2023 that we still need to normalize this conversation? Because I think it's kind of one of the last frontiers of things that people are just really uncomfortable with, don't know how to approach. And that's on both sides. That's on both, you know, the sides of the side of the person who may be suffering from some sort of mental illness. And on the side of, say, their employer who is on the receiving end of this information, I think there's still that last one where neither side really knows how to react. It's exactly on point, John. And I think it has to do with, of course, stigma. And, and the the simpler way to look at it is likely shame or guilt is in there to some degree, whether you're the one struggling or maybe you're the boss who doesn't feel equipped on how to handle something. I think shame and guilt are common uh, denominators on what we see as far as what prevents people to seeking help why uh, folks are afraid to to have important conversations. And the f- ironic part about it is pushing through and breaking through to have conversations is the mediator to um, sort of canceling out shame and guilt. So it's really about not avoiding it or brushing it under, under the rug, but having that transparency, sometimes with self or others, uh, and, and hitting it head on, but it's not easy to do. It takes courage. Yeah, that's really fascinating because I never thought about it that way in terms of, I mean, for sure, in terms of the person who's suffering from mental illness, I'm sure there's obviously lots of shame and guilt and all of those emotions associated. I, I never thought about the person on the other end uh, who's on the receiving end of it also having the shame and guilt because maybe, maybe they can't relate to it or maybe they, they can relate to it and that's even you know scarier for them. Sure. Absolutely. And you're right. It, it could be scary. It could be intimidating because perhaps that person doesn't want it to overlap with that part of their life with work or whatever that mm-hmm. looks like. So, yeah, um, I think it's all about leading from the front and, and whether you're, you're a student or you're a, you're a you know, a worker in your organization, how do you sort of have that um, courage, take that first step? It doesn't need, it need to be a big milestone. It doesn't need to be, you know, sharing your story with all 4,000 people in your company or whatever it is, but maybe it's just sitting down and having that initial, you know, two to three minute basic conversation with your, your most trusted coworker, your sort of best friend in the company, Mm -hmm. or, and it's really starting out small and that really leading from the front, having sort of a, a, a tidal wave effect into how we sort of operate in the workplace how we carry ourselves yeah i I think that's a great point about 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 starting small and uh and i think the other part is obviously you know we have seen i mean let's face it we have seen so many wellness initiatives in 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 companies over the years and corporate uh, environments which are fine you know they're fine but they always tend to be divorced right it's like physical health let's do a wellness let's do wellness around eating diet or exercising but they leave out the mental part and and we can't do that. I mean, cause your wellness is mind body. Right. Um, so I think part of it is our, is our own fault is that we have de-emphasized one part, emphasized another part and, and maybe created this kind of idea that, yeah, these things are acceptable, but that's not so much. 
Exactly. And in reality, they are synced, right? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes our sort of our body is dependent on our mind and our mind is dependent on our body. They sort of do go hand in hand and, and they must be prioritized, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of us would admit <laughs> that when we're when we look back on whatever you want to call it, our last few years or whatever, some of the, the most prominent or, or the healthiest times of our life are when, you know, we were we were right up here and when we were, you know, eating mm -hmm. well and physically fit and all that. So, um, you know, initiatives are great. Corporate initiatives are great. But again, sort of how do we how do we walk that walk ourselves and not rely on some um, sort of external check the box or external strategy, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the other things I, I feel that that people who struggle with mental illness, and even those who who on the other side, the ones who maybe they they want to talk to, whether bosses or, or coworkers or whatever, is that we don't want to be perceived as weak, right? Because we, in, in, in let's face it, we, we celebrate stress and anxiety and work. We think these are badges of honor. Like the more stressed you are, clearly the busier you are, the more important you are, the more important the work you're doing is. And, and therefore, like, I mean, as I've, as I've said to other mental health people, like, you know, if I come in with a broken leg into work, nobody's said, ooh, John must have weak bones. I'm going to look at him differently from now on. They just go, oh, John broke a leg and blah, blah, blah. But if I come in and say, oh, I'm suffering from some, you know, anxiety and they go, hmm, he's not as strong as I thought he was. And and it's a, it's such a different standard, right? Yeah, it sure is. And, and it's unfortunate that ha that it's, it's tended to be that way in society. Perhaps some of the reason for that is this notion of if you break a bone, you, you can't, like, there's 100% of that situation you can't control. But I think there's this perception of, like the mind, like even if it's not as well as it could be or whatever, like perhaps there's a percent of that scenario that we still can control. And to an essence, that's true. But at the same time, there's no, that's no excuse for what exactly what you just shared. That doesn't mm -hmm. provide a cop out for that. So um, I think as the receiver of a colleague who's struggling, or if you're a, a manager, a one of your employees that's struggling or a family or friend as the receiver of that information, as the receiver of sort of that, that story that was shared, how do we listen first versus speak? How do we receive that with grace and compassion and understanding and not look down, talk down, speak down, right? So I have mm -hmm. some humility ourselves just because maybe we're in a decent part of our life doesn't mean that, um, that person has to have it all figured out either we all go through ebbs and flows in life and that's just the reality so i think it you know as a receiver of information if you're not if you're the one who's listening to someone else struggling how do we have how do we listen first right and not, mm -hmm. not talk and then how do we lead and, and, and lead with grace and compassion and empathy and i think it it really lies on the fact that we must do our best to be able to understand the walk they're walking and, and the shoes that they are stepping in every day. We have to put ourselves in that place. Yeah, I, because I, no, that, I think that's really spot on because, uh, you know, let's face it. I mean, a lot of times, and especially if you're in maybe in a management position or a leadership position in a company, you feel obligated to fix things, to have a solution, to sort of say, okay, Greg, I, I hear you. Here's what you should do. And and that's and as you say, that's not the approach, really. The approach is to listen and understand and maybe from the get go realize that, no, I'm not actually I'm not qualified to fix this. But maybe I'm qualified to help in some way by, sure. as you said, by by listening. Absolutely, and it, it takes it takes humility in the workplace, in, in corporate, with all those pressures, moving up the ladder, other people expecting things of you, you know, from higher and from lower. It, it takes sometimes that that press the pause button, and how do I be most effective in this one situation? at this one time to this one person and blocking out the noise of distraction up or down. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I feel, and I mean, obviously you, you would know this better than I do, you know, if you're doing work in, in schools and universities, 
but there's a lot of young people obviously coming into the workforce now. I think we have, I think, five generations in the workplace, something like that. First time ever. It's uh, I can't remember them all, but now. Um, <laughs> but my my point being is we see in school kids like incredible amounts of anxiety and stress and depression, often a lot of it caused by social media, um, you know, same in you. So I feel like we're, we're also having a generation coming into the workplace that already have stressors and anxieties and stuff that perhaps those of us in, in current leadership positions don't really understand, can't really relate to. And, and I think it's becoming, it, it is becoming a bit of an issue because, you know, I mean, I, I, I've heard of people with, and I, I've even seen with my son's, you know, friends, you know, he's 18 now, but growing up, like some of them have serious, I mean, they get serious anxiety if they can't check their phone every minute, they lose signal, anything. I mean, it causes actual stress. Yeah, it's, it's a good point because it's such a widespread issue (laughs) it's that having that cross-generation uh workforce is so valuable in so many ways but obviously it prevents complex Mm -hmm. issues in other ways right and it's learning about again how to work best together how to you know effectively you know lean into to the right communication styles with those folks and all that and also have some empathy, right? Not necessarily mm. an excuse, not necessarily giving yeah. them a, a cop out, but having some empathy with whatever their challenge is. And you're certainly right. The younger folks with social media, with spending six to eight hours on screens per day, oftentimes more, um, that's just personal use, not including work, right? Like yeah. it's it's really removing this sense of, of community and sort of providing more of an individualistic approach to life. And I think we're having, seeing some of the, possibly some negative consequences of that. And and folks feeling anxiety in the workplace because maybe they're less familiar with what a real team is, with what a real humanistic dynamic is, with what a real, you know, co-working group looks like, where it's not, you know, sort of, this is not a, a, a crutch right this is yeah. not like the, the the primary thing we lean on and you, yeah and you and you can't just block me uh just because you don't like what i you know that, that maybe i asked you to do something that you don't like you can't just block me and move on which is what they which is what they used to do but i do think it's a i do think it, it is a real issue because i mean we're we're gonna have to we're gonna have to help on two sides, obviously, we're going to have to help, you know, older generations understand how to best leverage, you know, young people coming into the workplace. But also, as you said, young people coming into the workplace need to understand that maybe how they have grown up and maybe how they act in their personal lives and everything doesn't translate to work. Like they're going to have to learn some new ways. And that may involve getting off your phone <laughs> for a while. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, it's going to probably involve multiple changes and, and, and quite an adjustment period, right? I think we all go through it, you know, no matter what generation you're in, it's, there's always, in times of transition, there's uncertainty, there's unfam- unfamiliarity, right? Mm-hmm. But then again, with, with these 18, 20 year olds, it's, uh, it's a different ball game b- based on, you know, what the generational norm is for sure. Mm-hmm. And then when you when you work with uh, when you work with uh, corporations, what are some of the changes you have seen when corporation when start to actually focus on this topic and actually try to figure out how to to do the best that they can possibly do? Yep, I think there's a couple. I think one of them is again like it's not necessarily always about you know big wigs up top rolling out this new Mm -hmm. mental health initiative right like that could be valuable right but it's more so about how do how does someone like myself encourage you know a work team a workplace to have honest and authentic conversations with each other potentially blending personal and professional not always uh, but maybe a little bit of overlap Uh, again that doesn't necessarily need to means spill all your beans with all your coworkers. That's not what I'm implying, but um, how do we sort of uh, bridge that, bridge that gap a little bit? And so what I've seen is workplaces warming up to the idea of, hey, in order to work well, in order to achieve our KPIs, 
in order to, you know, play the role that I have been assigned to do in, in regards to, you know, doing well and helping my, my organization grow, that's probably going to be, um, it's going to be a benefit to bring mental health into the forefront versus under the brushing it under the rug. Like it's actually mm -hmm. going to play, be an asset to organizational health and organizational growth if it's at the forefront. And it's kind of, I think it's just been normalized that no, it, it, it can sit at the end, it can sit under the rug, right? It, it can be an afterthought, right? And I think it's more so, no, this is, this is a piece of the puzzle. This is certainly mm -hmm. an ingredient that matters, right? Just like other ingredients completely unrelated to mental health matter. And so um, it's all about having conversations, having sort of honesty and humility and leading up front yourself, but also as an employee, how do I help my coworker, Johnny or Rachel when they're go going through something? And it's not necessarily being their superhero or being their doctor, mm -hmm. but more so being a shoulder to lean on, really being a sense of consistency for them um, so that they know they can trust you time and time again for you to listen, for you to point them in the right direction. Perhaps that's actual resources that they may not be aware of, but in reality, just really meeting them where they're at, listening to understand, empathizing with them and doing that provides a great opportunity for you as the helper because a lot of people aren't willing to do that for others they're not mm. willing to sit in the struggle and meet them where they're at because it's hard it's yeah. hard you feel like you're gonna fumble you feel like you're gonna mess it up or say the wrong thing as the we use the word helper right but oftentimes showing up is enough i want to repeat that showing up is enough you don't always have to be the expert Showing up is enough because a lot of people don't show up for others, period. Yeah, and I think that's such a critical point for people to take away that idea of, uh, of showing up, that you don't have to, have, uh, honestly, you don't always have to do anything, as you said, too much. Just just be there. And, and you also mentioned this earlier, just come back to the empathy piece. Because it, it is surprising, because empathy is talked about all the time now. It's a bit of a buzzword at the minute, a bit of a flavor, you know, the soup du jour. But... Uh, but the reality is a lot of people don't even understand what empathy means. I mean, oftentimes people confuse it with sympathy and they think that if I empathize with you, I just sympathize with everything you tell me and I make you feel good, which isn't even in a situation like this, you do have to tell people to help. Them. They have to help themselves, too. So your job isn't to just isn't to sympathize with the person, empathize for sure, but encourage them to to take solid actions themselves. It's not yeah. a get out of jail free card. You're absolutely right. Sympathy and, and empathy are different, right? Sympathy is, it's, it's, it's quite different in the fact that empathy is about, again, how do I, as someone who may have different experiences or, or perspective, maybe I don't get what you're going through or background, right? How do I still not let that be the driver, but, but break through those sort of perceptions and still do my best to put myself in that person's shoes, even when I don't completely get it. So mm -hmm. then I can better understand, better listen, and, and therefore empathize, right? And yeah. when we do that, we build trust, we build camaraderie, we build friendship. And let's just say like, I mean, we're taking the most severe example, but if that person is experiencing suicidal ideation, the likelihood for them to not act on something like that is incredibly higher because they have even again like we have so much power in a way one of us one of us can by by acting in that way and sort of modeling those behaviors can sort of potentially save a life or, or change someone's mm -hmm. trajectory based on how we act and behave toward them in their times of great struggle and it's it's about not necessarily you wanting to be the hero for them but you just being there and empathizing with them, no matter what the, the dynamics are of the situation. 
Yeah, no, no, absolutely, Greg. And I think it's such an it's such an important lesson for people that sometimes less is more. Sometimes just being there for somebody. Some a lot of the times you don't have the answers anyway. So um, listening and trying to understand and trying to relate as best you can, and then encourage maybe encouraging the other person to take whatever next steps they need to take. Maybe their next step is to go and talk to their boss. Maybe their next step is to go and see a, a, a psychiatrist or whatever it is. Whatever sure. that next best step is. To just to encourage them, it's not your job to fix to fix anything. It's your job is to, as you said, your job is to just be there for people and make them feel like they're they're not alone. Sure, absolutely, and that's key. Is so many so many people feel alone um, because they believe that their what their past actions or their even past feelings or thought patterns are. It's almost like they've never been done before by anyone else. Like that is actually the terms they come to in their head that they believe. Because I, I, I know there, I, I've been that. I, mm-hmm. I was suicidal. I once was depressed, depressed and anxious. I went to four psychiatric hospitals. I spent eleven and a half months at a treatment center when I was seventeen. I get it. And the brain is powerful. You're right. And so, feeling like you're the only one in in on Earth or in your workplace who feels this way or that way is incredibly taxing and isolating and simply untrue and so mm-hmm. us as the the troops around that person have a have an opportunity to influence them for good and, um remind them that they're not alone remind them that um they're not the oddball out that you know there's yep. it's it's everyday life and it's okay to have yep. ebbs and flows and not Life is necessarily like this, you know, climb up Mount Everest. It's yeah. very volatile and it's okay to have that. Ab- absolutely. And uh, and again, it's funny because recently, like some surveys they've done of um, just employees, nothing to do with mental health or whatever, but just, you know, and people in general, what they, what most people just crave is to be seen, heard and understood. It's as simple as that. And, and it's amazing how many people don't feel seen, don't feel heard, don't feel understood. And yeah. And to see, you know, to see people understand them, you know, and, and acknowledge them, those are pretty easy things for people to do if you put your mind to it. Absolutely. And they go a long way, right? Mm-hmm. Like, just think back when you feel you genuinely feel seen or heard or understood. It's empowering. It's freeing, yeah. right? Like you get a really sort of walk in a sense of freedom like if those three things if you're seen heard and understood every moment in the workplace i mean think yeah, about yeah. what that think about what that does for how you go about your day-to-day monday through friday i mean it's incredibly free right it's, yeah. it's back to that word and so how do we embody that for others right it's yeah really absolutely do that well this has been great greg some great insights here all of greg's information is going to be below this video but before we go please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do yeah so um as john shared you know i am a professional mental health speaker with active minds active minds is the largest mental health nonprofit in uh the country really focusing on suicide prevention and mental health advocacy and awareness I speak on middle school, high school, university campuses, and corporate workplaces. Um, So I just love doing this type of thing and getting to connect with you folks. Um, I'm an author with the battle or for the battle against yourself, which I spent 20, 26 months writing during uh, my time as a college student at the university of Arizona, I was brought on by a publisher my senior year. And that's really kind of what launched this speaking journey, if you will. Um, So those two things are sort of what I do from an advocacy standpoint, as well as being a board member for the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance for the state of California. And then what I do full-time professionally, or I guess nine to five, is I work um, as a director of clinical outreach for Charlie Health. And Charlie Health is the first ever high acuity virtual intensive outpatient program. So we're really serving needs beyond one-on-one therapy, but not as severe as an inpatient or residential program. We're really serving the middle gap of the continuum of care. So I'm really um, expanding access to care, uh, to to mental health care in the state of California. And I really enjoy that. So from a clinical and an advocacy standpoint, I'm just, I'm entrenched in the mental health fields. I'm grateful for the opportunities and 
uh, certainly here to, to support all of you. Yeah, fantastic, Greg. Well, listen, it's uh, it's phenomenal work. It's it's, it's very important work, and uh, we appreciate you coming and sharing your insights today. So thank you for watching and listening. I'll see you all again soon. Thank you.